Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce Superintendent Arntzen. And we do have a slight change to our agenda this morning because of some scheduling. We are gonna move item four with our CFO, Ken Bailey, and our new CFO, Dave Williams, to item number two. With that, Superintendent. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful Tuesday across our state. Um, very happy that you're joining us today. We've got some new people that we'd like to introduce you to, uh, to our OPI team that are here to serve you. So we'll go ahead. I want to give a, a great shout out to Dylan Klatmeyer, who has joined us from the governor's office and who has uh, worked with us at OPI. So what a great partnership we have. Um, it is a month of celebration. It's a month of graduation, and it's a month of celebration for all of our teachers, all of our paras, everyone who has helped put our students first and forward in this very uncertain school year. So with that, uh, Sarah, please. Okay, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Williams, we're gonna move you up in the agenda. Uh, thanks, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. And could you stop sharing and allow me to screen share? Is everyone seeing my screen with ESSER update on it? Yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, it really, it's, it's, it, it's hard. Sorry? So uh, the first part, so uh, Elsie already covered a couple things that I want to say about where we are with ESSER. Um, what I'm showing here is for each of the wave of ESSER grants, the amount that was awarded to schools, and then next to it, the amount that's been paid out and what percentage. So, and the awarded amount includes the 90%, and then any money that we uh, added to that specifically for schools from the 10%. Like, for example, the money in ESSER 1 that we gave to schools that had not received Title I in the past. And the same is true for the others. So right now, we've uh, paid out $16.5 million of the original um, $37.8 million that were awarded to schools. On the ESSER Related Services grant, we've paid out $745,000. The ESSER 2 um, E-grants module is open, and I think we have around 10 applications that have been put in so far. Um, but of course, we haven't paid anything out. And the ESSER 3 uh, is showing that, or, or sorry, we will open on May 24th and uh, allow input at that time. Um, part of putting it up this way is to show that of the total amount that we've awarded directly to schools, um, we've only spent 17 million out of 546 million total through 2024, or 3%. Or in other words, we've barely scratched the surface of the total funding that, that is going to schools. Um, I'll mention three things, and then the first thing, the ARP requirements for the state plan, school plan, and some other things that are going on with our for example, uh, MPW has told us that other states will also open e-grants on um, May 24th because it's required, but they're gonna do things like not put any uh, budget pages in yet because of concerns that something will come out of ARP that requires sort of earmarking of flows going to school. <laughs> not ready to, to, to really authorize that yet. We're not taking that approach we're going to open and allow people to go in and start creating budgets. But I am just kind of worried about what all is going to come out of those ARP requirements. There's still a need for guidance to come from the Department of Education about ARP, I, I believe, before we'll fully understand that. The second thing is there's a lot of requests that I've seen for some fairly large uh, construction projects you know, HVAC systems and that kind of stuff, but some other building things as well. And, we, you know, we have tried to give guidance in terms of you got to look at not the ESSER grant, but the federal regulations associated with um, construction projects overall. 
And again, we've heard from other states that there's a big concern about this. Uh, the state of Kansas sent us something that they prepared for schools. And, and my counterpart said, our idea is basically to really warn schools about going down this road. Uh, we, we attended a CCSO meeting of small states regarding this question of uh, construction projects. That was part of the topic. And again, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety expressed of our school districts going to be able to meet all of the federal requirements and will there be a problem when audits happen with having met all those requirements? And the last thing, you know, we were surprised with ESSER 1 with the first round of uh, reporting we had to do to the feds. We tried to adapt ESSER 2 so we would be more able to do it. And now because of the stuff that's coming through our, we really wonder if we know what it is that we're gonna have to do for federal reporting. I think, as I've said, our intent is to try and get it so that the federal reporting can be accomplished directly out of e-grants and so that schools don't have to be, uh, you know, burdened by this. But I just question whether we know if that can be done or not. Um, so let me pause there before I turn it over to uh, Julie and see if there are any questions. So this is Elsie. I just want to reaffirm what Ken is saying. Because we have not received um, specific guidance or any guidance regarding ESSER 3 on those, uh, the variability of what we, what schools can use those dollars for. And what he just shared with what Kansas and other states are concerned about. Um, we want to just make sure that <laughs> We have, we have some understanding beforehand, and maybe that's why, if you look on this chart here, only 3% of this more than a half a billion dollars has been drawn down. And um, I appreciate that schools are cautious as we as a state agency are cautious. So um, thank you, Ken, very much for this. Any <laughs> other questions of Ken? Excuse me, I'll see one last comment I'll make on this is that regarding the amount that we've paid out so far, um, we also have about 70 school systems that have not drawn a dime of the ESSER 1 money yet. And so one of our um, key things to do, I think, over the next month or two is start reaching out to those school systems and trying to understand what their plans are. Because again, it's not just the ESSER 1 money. Uh, it's what's coming behind it, which is huge. Um, so that is something that we plan to do. Thank you, Ken, being very proactive. The other part of this is the application is a, uh, how do I want to say, a unified. Uh, so if I'm a, a district like uh, Helena or School District 2, where I have a K-8 or an elementary and I have a high school district, we have asked for those um, to be consolidated. So we have 308 working districts that are consolidated on these grants. And I think that is really important because we're trying to be efficient. The other part is making sure that the application has everything in it so we don't have to go back to the schools and ask them for any other verification. So the guidance coming from the federal government is exceedingly important so we know what to ask of schools and so schools know what's asked of them. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. So I do wanna just share on the video here, um, we have Dave Williams. Uh, Ken is retiring after seven great years of service here at the OPI and serving our schools. And um, his last day of service here is the 28th of this month. And welcome, Mr. Williams, if you just wanna give a quick update of who you are. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Superintendent. Um, yes, yeah, so I've, I've been, uh, I've spent the last 15 years in. Uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, I come from a background similar to Ken's, uh, finance, um, operations, and those types of things. Uh, I have uh, also spent the last 11 years, um, or spent 11 years, as a part-time adjunct um, uh, professor, faculty member at uh, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, in the finance department of the business school there. And I taught courses in finance and entrepreneurship. So thank you. Well, welcome. And Barb. Hi. 
I'm Barb Quinn, and I have worked for the state for quite a few years, and I've worked for OPI for the last four years, and recently trans transitioned into this role of school finance manager. Um, so nice to meet you all. Thank you, Barb. And Jeff. Hi, my name is Jeff Kirksey. I am the new ESSER program manager. I come from about 20 years uh, working in post-secondary education. Um, I am, I, at the institution I currently, uh, or that yeah. I just, I'm no longer there as of just the last week. <laughs> uh, um, I've been serving as the chief student affairs officer and the chief operations officer, uh, but managing all of our COVID related uh, response um, and working with uh, federal requirements on the higher ed stimulus side. So um, uh, translating that to uh, working with helping our school districts. And on top of that, I get to come home to Broadwater County, so. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. And Janie is not available to be on this call today, but she is a, a teacher in Ronan, and we're really excited to bring her in on the ENs or the non-public side of this disbursement of COVID relief dollars. So we're here to serve you, and these are new people that, uh, not necessarily, but they are, they are all here to support you uh, as this grant opens, all of the grants open, uh, making sure that we um, serve our students in, in the manner that we can in Montana. So thank you very much for that team. All right, next thing on the agenda that we have, um, Dr. Mergel, and we just got off a, a consultation with the governor. That is one of the uh, requests of anything that we do with the federal government is bring in the executive office. And, you know, I'll just have to say this. The governor gave me four points of homework and I did, I did point that out. He said he's not going to be too tough of a grader. But what I really appreciate from this is that he is, uh, he's looking at it. He's, he's engaged in it. And he's not on the fringe at this point. So we are very pleased that we had that conversation. And Dylan, thank you for bringing him to the table on this. Dr. Mergel, let's talk about the state plan. Great, it's good to see all of you. Yes, I am Julie Merkel. I am a senior manager here at the OPI and I oversee the Department for School Innovation and Improvement. And so I'm gonna share my screen with you here. Um, uh, can you guys see that okay? Okay, so um, I'm more on the uh, program side, not so much at all on the fiscal side, but these two things are very blended um, and um, are one full package. So the part that we're talking about today when we're looking at the ESSER um, as the third round of funding, the ARP funding, the American Rescue Plan. And so I just want to give you a high level presentation on the requirements that go along with that third funding stream, which is ESSER 3, if you will. So that um, has really two main purposes when we look at the American Rescue Plan under ESSER 3. That's to help ensure safe operations and maximizing in-person instruction. We recognize that many of our schools in Montana have remained open. And so really this is about them continuing all of those operations that they've already been doing to sustain in-person instruction and maximizing that. Um, there's a second piece as well, and that's to address the impact that the pandemic has had on our students, whether it be academic, social, emotional, or, emotional or mental wellness. So there's two components to this uh, third bucket of money. Um, it is still currently under interim rule. The final rule will come on May 24th and they're still taking uh, comments on this particular rule. It went into effect on April 22nd. Um, and as part of that, um, they're requiring a couple of things to happen. <laughs> so the requirements are to ensure that we do meaningful consultation, gather public input, so that we can develop a state plan. And the state plan really outlines how we're going to use and um, allocate and set up the programming and the technical support for these um, ARP funds. And then the second piece is that this, the districts have to have two plans that um, are implemented. So this is just kind of the timing timeline, you guys. It is a very fast timeline to get these dollars out, get this support out, and really to be supporting our schools. 
so that our students get those supports as fast as they can get them. So our state plan you'll see here is due June 7th. And um, then we have a deadline for the state to post information as well on the website about the mode of instruction that has been occurring in this past school year. And we'll continue to update that into the new school year. And so that's based upon the number of students that are um, work in remote, those that are in person, those that are in a hybrid model, and then by the, the, the student group. So our special education students, what were the mode of instruction that they were in? So when we look here, you guys, there's really three key deadlines, three key requirements from this ARP funding for the state level. And then I'll share with you in a minute what the requirements are for the district level. Ken has already mentioned that the allocation for SO3 dollars will be being pushed out through e-grants on May 24th. And that's a key date that um, has impacts for what the districts are gonna need to do following that. And our state plan is due on the 7th. And like I mentioned, we have to post on our website information about the mode of instruction. So you'll see these are, are the three key deadlines right now that are at play at the state level. Then we have two plans that the districts have to do. The first is a safe to return instruction and continuity of service plan. That plan needs to be developed and made publicly available on district websites within 30 days of the allocations. So if May 24th is the date when the allocations are released, there's the 30 day mark would be June 24th will be the day at which districts are expected to put on their website kind of the mode of instruction that is occurring in their districts and how they're ensuring that they'll continue to be offering and maximizing in-person instruction. Those plans will need to be updated every six months until September of 2023. So share this with you as one of the key dates um, and key requirements that are gonna be uh, required for our, for our districts. Uh, we recognize that many of the districts already have had plans and have had that in place for quite some time now. So it may just be going back and updating that and just be sure that the most current thing is available. We certainly will be helping support our districts however we can to help you meet whatever requirements are within this ARP. We can help you get to yes as soon as possible. We wanna be sure that we're playing the role of being support, if you will. So as we take a look at the second requirement for our districts, within 90 days of receiving the allocations, districts need to submit to the state a district ARP ESSA plan. And there are some requirements here that I've listed that each of these uh, state plans will need to encompass, if you will. And so one of them is to ensure that the, the district is using that to implement any prevention or mitigation strategies to ensure safe environments. There's a requirement for 20% set aside to address lost instructional time and using an implementation of evidence-based interventions. Then there's got to be a description of how the district is going to use the remaining funds outside of that 20%. Um, and then really, how are they going to ensure that that 20% is addressing uh, the academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs of the students who were most impacted by the, the COVID pandemic? Last piece as part of this plan will be to ensure that the districts engage in stakeholder input with their plans as well. So as you can see here, you guys, we are, um, have a team over here at the OPI with some of wonderful faces here already on the screen today that have worked with you, but also some other folks that are behind the scenes here. Um, and so uh, at the OPI, we are working diligently to really get our state plan out there. We're working to conduct input uh, from our stakeholders to really be sure that the plan represents what Montana uh, wants to see happen in here and that flexibility and local control that we know is uh, really important here in Montana. We're working to get the website ready so that we can publish that information there. We're working to help our districts and get these things set up so that they know what they need to do for the safe return um, plans that need to be posted on the website. And the last thing is really working to put a, a template together for districts that will be meaningful and manageable and simple. Something that districts can do, put together, and will be um, available. There's a couple of key topics that I'm going to share with you in this short amount of time. Um, and there's uh, some pieces here that I think are important to note. 
and that is maintenance of equity is a new piece that is coming from the department and have not they've not clearly uh, delineated or laid that out either. So as you've heard from uh, Superintendent Arnson earlier and from Mr. Bailey, we're still in um, a place where we're it's really fluid. We're still receiving a lot of information for the department and we're trying to get that out to all of you in real time so that it makes sense so that we are not coming back to you to our districts and to our stakeholders three times rather one time. So just a couple of things I think that are important. This plan has seven different sections and it just kind of goes from identifying and prioritizing what the current needs are out in our schools by different uh, student groups. What we have already done uh, to help ensure that the um, environments where our students are learning are safe. There's a piece around coordination of funds, which I think is really critical when I think about what Tim just shared with us, is how really are districts using all of the federal funding and braiding that funding from ESSER 1 to ESSER 2 to ESSER 3 and thinking about coordination of those funds. Um, talked about the state uh, set aside. So there's 10% of this funding that has been already uh, set up from the legislature of what that 10% set aside is going to be used for. Um, so that'll be a description in our plan there. There's a part about how we're really um, going to help districts with that, that LEA plan. And so describing it in the state plan, we must describe what the district plan is gonna look like and then how we're gonna work with our districts on that. There's a portion, there's a portion on here, which is, is kind of new in a way, I think, about supporting the educator workforce. That's not something we've necessarily seen in the ESSA plan or other federal uh, regulations or requirements. So this is, an, I think, an exciting place actually. And then the last piece is just as Ken had mentioned about that reporting, but how are we gonna monitor and measure um, progress here? And so that piece is really important around the use of the dollars and then the impact of the dollars, which um, uh, I think that data modernization system is gonna be huge as we think about how we really gather some of that data. So this is just kind of you guys high level of what this state plan looks like. We are currently engaging in stakeholder input. Um, I'm very thankful that Friday I was able to present to the Board of Public Ed. Yesterday, we conducted two webinars um, and we uh, will be having our third webinar here this morning right at 1030. I also wanna note that we uh, put out a survey link and I will also put this link for you in the chat here as soon as I get finished. And that closes on the 21st. We have already 300 surveys in, in within five days. So please spread that uh, as far and wide with all of your constituents, encourage you to complete it as well. But this survey is really giving us an input about that state plan on all those areas that I just shared with you. Um, and I also just wanna just kind of share with you uh, really quickly, um, we are getting more definitions from the from the department around some of these pieces like what is evidence based intervention and practices and what does that mean. So we'll be sure to include some technical assistance on our websites around some of these key details about when they're saying evidence based interventions, what do they mean. Um, so I'll be including some of this on our website. They've also kind of defined you guys, if you will, learning loss. Uh, the department is not using the term learning loss. They're using uh, the term of uh, lost instructional time. And so when they re that's the term that they're using, which I think is really significant because it's not about that students have lost learning, but rather it's unfinished or maybe they may not have had time yet to get to that learning. So these are some critical definitions. Um, and I think that's really important as we start to kind of get all of this out there is that we're communicating what are these expectations around um, the terminology that is coming from the Department of Education? So like maintenance of equity, what does that new term mean? Um, so I say to you, here's a, a great picture uh, for us on our website. If you go to the main website, right on that first piece at the opi.mt.gov, you'll see a button there for find ESSER information here. And when you click on that, there's a lot of information already about ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, and that's where we will be adding information about ESSER 3 as we're getting it so that we're continually communicating with you guys about what's happening. So my final thing is to say, if you want to know more about everything I just said from maintenance of equity to educator input to what's this workforce development in the state plan? What do you mean there's going to be a district plan? 
oh, you mean there's two district plans? What's the difference between the two? Or um, when is it due? And uh, can we make some suggestions to OPI about what we think the process should look like for those state plans? Uh, what we think should be in them? Please join us here at 1030 or complete the survey. And as always, you can also e email us here at the OPI. Um, uh, Jeff, I will be sure Jeff puts his email in the chat box there. He's available and has been taking tons of questions from the field already. So uh, that's what I have for you today. Like I said, it is fluid and it's an ever moving target. It's a very, very quick process. So we will keep you posted on all of the progress that we make and we will definitely be working diligently here at Montana at the OPI to be sure that we're putting students first and emphasizing local control, flexibility, and sustainability. Superintendent, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Questions for Julie? I know it was rather quick and a lot of information. You will be receiving this slideshow presentation and all the other documents that we've shared um, in our reflections as soon as this meeting concludes. The one thing that I want to point out as state superintendent, the date of May 24th is important. It's when ESSER 3 opens uh, via, via where we need to be. But the other part is that's where the comments close on this. You know, our school systems are so unique across our state. And I'm going to be looking very carefully to see what kind of waivers we might need to do to make sure that it's not dilatory work for our very small rural schools. So I see Mr. Cahill, you're on. And I want you to understand, we're gonna to have to have more conversations offline here on what are the impacts to our very rural schools? Not saying that our big schools or our schools of maybe 200 students have all the capacity to complete this, their LEA plan, as well as a six month revision or all of those things. And what about the question, if the government now is changing what's written in the law of learning loss to now whatever that school closure might have looked like, what if schools were left open? What if students did have that opportunity to go to school and not just brick and mortar, but had the opportunity to learn? So lots of questions that we're asking and we're asking because we know that one size doesn't fit all. We're here to serve. So I'm sure uh, Dr. Mergel is here if you have any questions. And Jeff, you see on the screen is going to be leading, you know, any of the discussions that in that relationships that we have with schools. So any questions of me at this point before we move to our data modernization discussion with Michael? Perfect. Michael. Lead it away. Good morning, everybody. Can First off, can you hear me OK? Great, great. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Michael Sweeney. I'm the chief data officer. Um, I'm going to go through an abbreviated presentation. I see a lot of familiar uh, faces here from a couple of Fridays ago um, where we did a longer uh, presentation of the data systems modernization project that you've heard mentioned today. So um, real briefly, the purpose of today is just to provide you a brief overview of, of how OPI expects to fulfill the expectations of the recently passed legislation. Um, just want to point out um, that for the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 dollars for which the uh, data systems modernization is being funded, um, that the general uses of those funds were addressed by the legislature and the OPI worked with uh, MontPEC education advocate organizations and others to arrive at a uh, consensus recommendation um, with the legislature for these uses. And then those were codified in House Bill 630 and 632. And you can see the um, respective uh, appropriations. And um, they specifically said, purposes were for database modernization. They came with the condition um, that the funds must be used by the Office of Public Instruction to repair, improve, or replace existing data systems. And I'm gonna say to respond to lost learning time, that's the actual verbiage there from, from the actual uh, law that was passed, but as, as uh, Julie pointed out, we're really calling that lost learning time as a more accurate reflection. And it's consistent with 
20-7-104, which is our transparency and public availability of school performance data statute. And I always like to point out the very first sentence of that statute says um, the OPI, uh, I'm sorry, the Office of Public Instruction statewide data system must at a minimum include data entry and intuitive reporting options that school districts can use to make timely decisions that improve instruction and impact student performance while creating a collaborative environment for teacher, parents, teachers, and students to work together in improving student performance. So I've called this my Bible. I've called this, this is, this is kind of our guiding principles and guiding law that um, kind of reflects what, why we are doing what we're doing. And then to simplify that, um, this is going to be a collaborative effort of the OPI with school districts to reduce and hopefully eliminate um, the friction associated with collecting, reporting, and using data. Go, the reasons we're doing this is we want to save time. We want to reduce duplicate and unnecessary data entry, and then that enables automation within and between systems. We want to secure that data. Um, if we're saving folks time, um, we can start to look at data use. So we want to support data use. So we have all this data. Let's start making good use of it. Julie was um, referring to that in her presentation. And then, of course, we need to be sustainable. We need to ha have these systems operate past this initial funding round. We've decided, or as we've looked at this, I should say, we're thinking that um, we want to collapse the number of systems and business processes we have. And we're looking at doing that into four main areas, uh, student management, education, educator management, fiscal management, and then what we're calling digital infrastructure. When we talk about a timeline, um, and again, feeding off what uh, Julie was just presenting, we have very aggressive timelines that are being driven by the funding. So you can see there that the SR2 funds are must be fully expended by February 2024, and the SR3 funds February 2025. Seems like a long ways away, but um, those years will come quickly to us. So major tasks that are happening this month, we're getting the appropriations set up and available to spend. Um, as Julie went into great depth, we're working on um, providing information and participating in the overall ARP ESSER plan. And we're looking at um, bringing on a project partner to assist us with project initiation tasks and focus groups and helping us uh, put together um, a potential RFP for consulting firms. I'll just um, dwell on this point for a moment. The project partner is, um, so there's a lot of good people here at the OPI. We're seeking some partnerships with folks who have experience and ability in the field to uh, really look at that other side of this equation and help us, help guide us to uh, putting together a project that's going to really meet the needs of our districts that are ultimately the main users of these data systems. Uh, moving into June, we hope to bring on a consulting firm. And this is, I want to be clear about what a consulting firm would do. This is, um, the plan itself is going to come from the OPI and our partners in the districts and, and our education advocate partners. A consulting firm will help supplement the skill sets um, both at the districts and here at the OPI to provide the technical resources um, that could be project managers, business analysts, uh, skills of those natures to help uh, provide those, those types of services that we're gonna need. But this will be our project. Um, we're gonna, and how we're gonna make this our project, we're gonna be convening the data modernization focus groups and the K-12 data task force to solicit feedback and validate the strategy and approach that we're taking. Um, we are already in the process of hiring a project manager to begin the educator management projects. And that's, um, we're looking at a new educator licensure system. Um, for those of you who've been connected or paid attention to this, this is something that we've been looking at for a fair bit of time here. So the timing just happens to work out on that. 
Um, going into the summer and fall, we're going to hopefully have that consulting firm hired and the focus groups uh, would continue to convene or finalize those strategy and approach decisions. Um, we want to move quickly, but we also want to move um, deliberately and take the time necessary. And so we don't know what we don't know. So we must get that collective buy-in and approval. Um, we do expect that educator management, the licensing system to start in the summer, hopefully in July is what we're targeting for. And a lot of that to be uh, clear here, it's just a lot of internal work we still have to, uh, to get done before um, that's, that's ready to go out and be solicited. Um, move this next into the timeline, fall 2021 and beyond. Um, that's when the real roll up your sleeves work begins and act, uh, procurement and analysis activities by the consulting firms. And I should also say by OPI staff and then um, districts that will be participating um, at some, in some manner, um, we're all gonna be rolling up our sleeves over the next, next uh, year to, to accomplish this. And then spring and summer 2022, so a year from now is when we expect to see um, some of those uh, initial efforts to come to fruition. I would expect to see um, a licensing system to begin to be deployed um, within, within a year. So um, very exciting times. So stay informed, we've put up a website. You can um, subscribe to get uh, email updates, but that's the, the website address and we will keep uh, that place up to date with fresh information on the project. So just a quick thank you. Um, and again, uh, for those of you who know me, those that don't know me, I am always open to reaching out to me directly, questions, concerns, if you, if you wanna participate, if you have ideas, I am all ears. I've been shaking, uh, what I call, I've been shaking a lot of trees throughout the state, trying to talk to different people and make sure we're hearing the voices that need to be heard to help inform us and do this correctly. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any questions for Michael at this point? We pretty much laid out a roadmap and not that we have to stay on that path, but we are looking for partnerships. We are looking to see, to make sure that this is not the state doing it to schools. We need to make sure that we are a collaborative mode to uh, streamline, to make sure we're very efficient. If I can have teachers teach, what a great opportunity this is to make sure that our data systems are aligned to that very same thought. I've taken us a little bit over a half hour. Any questions you might ask of us? Well, thank you all. Please stay well. Um, again, I'll come back to the, and I spoke at this McCall at the Board of Public Ed meeting. This is a month of celebration. You know, let's look back on what had happened this year. Let's be proud of the resiliency of our Montana teachers, as well as our parents and of our students. So with that, let's celebrate the month of May. And I wanna say thank you all. And of course, thank you to our CFO who is departing, Ken Bailey. He has worked so diligently for our students in making sure that that fiscal support gets out for great opportunities for our students. With that, please all stay well. Thank you, bye-bye.